Hello everyone and welcome to Daily News Simplified, your one-stop solution to detailed analysis of current affairs which are published in the Delhi edition of the Hindu newspaper. Articles dated 7th February 2023 are listed on your screen and the time stamping along with the notes in PDF and Word format are given in the description box. So let us begin with the first article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 9 and talks about the recent visit made by the Canadian Finance Minister on the pretext of India-Canada strategy dialogues. Now in the UPSC's mains examination in your general studies paper 2, India's bilateral relations are extremely important. One year or the other UPSC asked one question from different nations to which India had different levels of bilateral relations. In the past, they have asked with respect to US, Japan, Russia, Israel, Africa and many other entities. So, based on the same, we are going to take it with respect to the GS paper 2 on the bilateral relations of India. In the upcoming discussion, we are going to look into the historical developments between the relations and also the pre-independence historical relations, economic relations, political relations, security and defense relations. We are going to look into how both the countries are looking at their current geopolitics. How Canada has come up with newly released Indo-Pacific strategy where India is a major stakeholder. We are also going to look into the situation of diaspora in Canada and the issues related in the bilateral relations. Later on, we are going to look into the possible way forwards to improve the relations further. The reason for taking this discussion is that in 2019, UPSC asked a bilateral related question between India and Japan in the mains examination GS paper 2, where the question actually asked about the contemporary relationship between these two countries, one evolving the global and the strategic partnerships. On the similar line, UPSC can ask the question related to India and its relationship with Canada. So today we are going to look into the bilateral relation between these two countries in much detail. So we'll start from the historical relation first. So as far as pre-independence relations are concerned, so Canada was a dominion under the British Empire between 1867 when it was declared as a confederation and it remained as a dominion under the British till 1982 when it got the complete independence. Yes, the independence of Canada came across in 1982. In the pre-independence relation between India and Canada were based mostly on the revolutionaries activities. So most of the Indians who were residing in Canada, including Tarak Nath Das or G.D. Kumar and the members of Ghadar party were involved in the revolutionary activity. Tarak Nath Das created Free Hindustan in Vancouver, while G.D. Kumar created Swadesh Sevak Home in order to spread the revolutionary ideas and get the viewpoints of Indians living abroad. Ghadar party also had their influence to the members of Indian community living in Canada. You must have heard about the Komagata Maru incident which took place as a tragedy to the Ghadar party revolutionaries. If we talk about the Komagata Maru, well Komagata Maru was a Japanese steamship which was sailing right from British India to the places in Canada and this was the year of April 1914. But because of the security concern, as we have discussed that Canada was also under the British Empire, so Canadian authorities denied entry to this ship on the mainland and they were forced to return back to India. When they returned back to India in Baj Baj, Calcutta, they were attempted with the arrest. Many of them protested and on the firing of the police, 22 people of the ship died. Now why the police arrested these people? There were apprehensions that they are going to create law and order situation, might create revolutionary activities in the states, in the areas like Bengal and Punjab. So these were the important pre-independence relations between India and Canada. After post-independence, as India became an independent nation and a sovereign, it started becoming a more vibrant in terms of creating relations with other countries. And one of them was Canada. So the bilateral relation between both the countries started in 1947. Jawaharlal Nehru, the first prime minister, visited Canada in 1949 to start the bilateral relation formally. But there were two hiccups between these two countries. The first one was in 1974, when India started its nuclear program through the test of a nuclear bomb under Smiling Buddha program. 
after this canada alleged india to be promoting the nuclear power arsenal and compiling the nuclear weapons for the non peaceful manner as india is one of the nation which has not signed the nuclear non proliferation treaty the apprehension still remains looming the second issue was the decade of 1980s when six separatists had the tendency to create the terrorist like situation this is the period when the demand of khalistan was very high in punjab region of india because of this and one more incident where indian airline plane was actually hijacked and all the passengers were killed in a terrorist attack both these incident created a reign of terror activities in canada vis-a-vis india however despite these ups and downs in the bilateral relationship there were certain areas where india and canada could make some headway and the most important one was the economic relation after india's liberalization in 1991 economic integration between both these country began in 2021 based on the latest data india was canada's 14th largest export destination and 13th largest trading partner and this is not only with respect to asia both the countries are in the partnership and are looking forward to conclude the comprehensive economic partnership agreement which is also the free trade agreement and foreign investment promotion and protection agreement to promote fdi and fpi in terms of commercialization of the power canada is one of the nation which has stood by india to provide the uranium supplies for the peaceful use of nuclear power and this became a reality in 2010 when a nuclear cooperation agreement was signed between both these countries as of 2019 and 20 bilateral trade between these two countries was around 6.73 billion dollar but it was in favor to canada that is there is a trade deficit to india indian oil corporation has invested heavily in british columbia for the fossil fuel exploration commercial arms of isro that is antrish has also launched some of the commercial satellites for canada so be it the space be it the energy or any other sector economic returns have been grooming in the bilateral relations of both these countries now coming to the political relations the political relations and the bilateral visit began since 1947 as we have seen in 1949 prime minister jawaharlal nehru paid a unilateral visit to canada in 2015 there was a headway when the bilateral relations were uplifted to strategic partnership where both the countries have decided to take strategic relationship on important matters in a composite manner In 2020 the extensive support in the medical supplies were given by India to the Canada most of the medicines which are required for the treatment or the basic treatment of covid patients were supplied by India to Canada in 2020 not only that even in the social sector they have created a joint working group where higher education has been supported the same joint working group was also created for counter terrorism Education is a priority for India in terms of Canada's relationship because the education level in Canada is mostly on the lines of what is followed in India but the quality or the standards which are provided to the children is much higher hence India is looking to provide the same level of quality of education even to the Indian children in terms of counter terrorism as both have been the victim of terrorist activities in the past they share the common history hence have stood up with each other on the counter terrorism cooperation the recent visits were made by prime minister narendra modi to canada and prime minister justin trudeau to india in terms of security relations well the first one would be in terms of the terrorist activity which have been common to both these countries the first example here would be the air india flight 182 the incident of 1985 this was an unfortunate incident when a flight of air india which which took off from europe going all the way to canada was hijacked and there was an explosion in the flight when all the people on the flight died and 90% of the people on the flight were canadian this brought bitter relation between both these countries the second was the demand of khalistan khalistan is a demand by some of the sikh separatist to create a homeland for the sikh community and 
establish a sovereign state as Khalistan, which is the land of Khalsa. And this is supposed to be created in Punjab. This movement has gained a support in Canada and also supported by some of the organizations from Pakistan indirectly. This also brought a bitterness between the bilateral relationship of India and Canada because Canada also houses one of the largest Sikh population outside India. Going by this bitter relationship in the 1980s, there was a gap of smooth relations between both these countries for a decade or two. But in terms of security and defense, the decade after 2000 has seen a quantum jump in terms of the cooperation. Now there are mutual ship visits of each navy. Canada is now being partner to the Quad in defense exercises as we have seen in the year 2021. And as we have discussed, they are also part of the counter-terrorism working group. In terms of the diaspora and people-to-people -people relationship, well, 16 lakh Indians are now residing in Canada, which is one of the highest. This includes the person of Indian origin, which have traced their origin in India. Maybe their grandfather, great-grandfather had been the citizens of India or the people of non-resident Indians, that is Indian citizens who are residing in Canada and they do not hold the citizenship of Canada. 4% is the total population of Canada which comprises Indian diaspora. 22 Indian members of parliaments are working in Canada which you can imagine that how Indians are influential in the Canadian politics. Six are one of the largest communities. Both nations have now established Track 1.5 as a dialogue partnership. Track 1.5 dialogue is nothing but a form of diplomacy where official and non-official sit together to try to find a solution to the existing problems. Now beyond this, there is an another dimension to this bilateral relation which is Canada's Indo-Pacific strategy. Now as far as geopolitics is concerned, both Canada and India are now looking into the expansion of their footprint in the Indo-Pacific region. Why? Indo-Pacific region is important not only in terms of the overall economic expansion because of course, the largest share of international trade passes from Indo-Pacific, but also this region is now seeing the rise of new powers. It is now a hotspot of geopolitics. So be it India, be it China, be it US or Russia, all of them want to create their footprints in the region. There's a rise of quad between India, Australia, Japan and US as a security provider in the region. Majority of world trade passes through these ocean water. There's a rise of new powers in the geopolitics that is China, India, Japan and Australia. And Canada's major trading partners lies even in the Indo-Pacific region. The top 13 of Canada's trading partner, including India, lies in the Indo-Pacific region. And because of this shared region, Canada has brought up its own Indo-Pacific strategy. The first part of this strategy is to promote peace, resilience and security. The moment we say security, the biggest threat comes out to be in the form of China. Now China is expanding its defense hegemony. You must have heard about the recent incident where a balloon of experimental purpose was blown down by US and this balloon belonged to China. It was going past the US and it was considered as a security threat by the US authorities. The second part of this strategy would be to expand trade and investment along with the expansion of supply chain resilience. The moment we say supply chain resilience, it means that the international economic order is now going through multiple shocks. Previously, we had been through the excessive recession. It was followed by inflation. Then there were a slight boom and then it was followed by the COVID crisis. One way or the other, be it the bilateral wars, be it the embargo implemented by a particular nation, there are certain supply chain shocks. And because of these supply chain shocks, a nation cannot access all the resources from the outside world. For example, there was an oil embargo implemented by US on Iran. The moment this was implemented, India was under the oil supply shock. Now, in order to be resilient towards the supply chain, India should diversify its portfolio of oil imports. 
and that is the reason why the nations are now talking about supply chain resilience so that in the case of emergency they are not left out with the poor supply of a certain product the third part of the strategy would be to invest in and connect people canada wants to explore the untapped market in asia especially in the regions like china india and southeast asia where the expansion of population can provide large amount of market to the products sold by canada and they also want to connect people in order to create or expand their soft diplomacy the fourth part of this strategy is to build a sustainable and green future of course because now we are shifting towards the net zero emission the entire world is talking about the reduction of the greenhouse gases and this strategy of canada is one such initiative the fifth one is that canada want to be an active and engaged partner in the indo pacific because it is the center or the hotbed for the upcoming geopolitics of 21st century and canada does not want to be left out now india is seen to be the pivot to indo pacific us is now playing its cards on india australia and japan are also looking into creating india as a major player in the indo pacific and india as one of the net security provider in the indian ocean presence of canada with india in the indo pacific region and supporting india in the expansion of indo pacific strategy would be canada's one of the future dream and india should take it as a welcome step and help canada to be on the same path now after this entire discussion we would be in a position to provide some way forward we have gone through the important challenges in the security and others so these are the following way forward that we can utilize the first challenge would be to talk about the security in terms of security challenge collaborative manner should be taken up to deal with the khalistani issue both the government can talk to the different stakeholders and the representations with the communities and try to resolve the issue the second is that new areas of cooperation could be looked into for example climate change as it is one of the part of the indo pacific strategy of canada wto reforms especially access to markets of the developed nation and both the countries can support each other in the unsc reforms india is one such nation which has the potential of high fdi and canada should look into for more of its participation both the countries should try to engage more with each other on the platform utilizing such as g20 or g7 there should be more cooperation of energy especially in terms of the renewable one and they should try to cooperate on those areas where they hold the expertise pharmaceutical is one area where canada has an upper hand and india can utilize that avenue to make its own industry more vibrant With this discussion please let us now move to the next article for the day This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared on page 1st and talks about a very unfortunate incident that took place in nations such as Turkey and Syria where an earthquake with a magnitude of over 7 had killed almost 2600 people and the deaths are still counting The context of the article says that three earthquake measuring 7.8 7.6 and 6.0 magnitude on the richter scale has devastated turkey and syria and there were impact which were felt to cyprus lebanon israel and even egypt now before dwelling into the article we should understand what is richter scale see earthquake is a physical phenomena hence it is available for the measurement the earthquake can be measured with respect to its magnitude and this magnitude of earthquake can be measured into waves which are known as seismic waves whenever earthquake occurs there are series of seismic waves and these waves actually brings vibration to the earth crust when these vibrations are measured with respect to their magnitude we try to put that under richter scale method this method was created developed by Charles Richter on which this is named in 1935 and it ranges between 1 to 10 10 being the most devastated ever however in the recorded history of the earthquake 10 has not been observed with each and every increment that is from 6 to 7 7 to 8 8 to 9 there is a 10 fold increase of the seismic energy that is released for example 
the magnitude of 7 is about 31.6 times that is almost 3100 percentage greater than that of the magnitude and that is the reason why two earthquakes of 7.8 and 7.6 are so so devastating now when we talk about the basic richter scale this diagram will help you to understand when we talk about the richter scale of one magnitude it is micro sometimes not even felt in the minor that is 2 and 3 there might be a minor shaking of smaller objects in terms of 4 there might be a more shaking of smaller objects but when we talk about 5 and above there might be the cracks in larger objects so in terms of 5 there might be a crack in the buildings but minor crack in terms of 6 there might be a shaking in larger objects in terms of 7 there will be destructions in the larger of objects and in 8 or above there will be falling down the complete devastation of larger objects as far as magnitude is concerned so this is your seismograph which help in measuring the overall earthquake impact so the ground of the seismograph is attached to the base or the crust of earth whenever there is a vibration the frame over here also vibrate this vibration then transformed to the wire ultimately to an heavy object this heavy object is connected to a pen and this pen vibrates the more it vibrates the more is the tracing of the vibration on this paper drum so it's a simple physical phenomena more vibration means more seismograph tracing as far as the earthquake on syria is concerned so these are the two focus and according to the u.s geological survey it was 18 kilometer deep in the earth crust the epic center of the earthquake was 33 kilometers from the Gaussian step as you can see on the map this is the Gaussian step so do prepare this for the map itself now the question is why this region has registered such a devastating earthquake as you can see on the map this region is known as North Antolinian fault it is a meeting point of two important tectonic plates the Eurasian plate and the Antolian plate as you can see on the screen this is the region where Eurasian plate and Antolian plate is meeting up and on the screen you can see all these different plates some of them are major like African and Eurasian and some of them are minor so these major and minor plates are moving in the opposite direction Eurasian plate coming downward Arabian plate going upward and the so is true with the African plate so they are creating the convergent boundary where two different plates are converging to each other the moment we say converging or diverging plate boundaries create tectonic effects and they are part of the tectonic plates more they create the tectonic activity more is going to be the presence of earthquake because of the various faults now in terms of the earthquake as you can see there are major plate tectonic and the earthquake which are associated with each other there are three of them first is the rapture and the fault along with the constructive plate boundaries so as you can see the first diagram over here where there is constructive plate boundaries why constructive because of the divergent boundaries two different bound plates are moving in the opposite direction there is a coming up of the new one and because of the new one which is coming up there is a ruptures as this is the coming up of a particular plate the earthquakes are mostly shallow that is the depth of the earthquake is low such kind of plate boundaries are found in the divergent sections with a slow foci and moderate earthquake so here the earthquakes remain more or less moderate the best example of this could be seen in the mid atlantic ridge mid indian ocean ridge and the east pacific rise the second one is the subduction zone where the oceanic crust submerged under the continental crust here we see both kind of shallow and depth earthquake the third one is the continental crust where both the sides we have the continent and here we also see some of the shallow as well as deep earthquake at the convergent boundaries we have high magnitude of the earthquake which have deep foci and they are very deeper in subduction the best example of these kind of earthquakes are seen in the circum pacific belts as you can see on the screen this is a region where we have most of the tsunamis in the pacific region 
The fourth one is the transform fold boundary where two different continental crust slide with each other. These are mostly the shallow earthquakes and not the deeper one. In terms of the overall distribution of the earthquake, these are the three important ones. The first one is Circum Pacific. As you can see, this is the Circum Pacific belt where the majority of the annual earthquake takes place and most of them lies above 7 to 8 on the Richter scale. It has the highest share of earthquake. It has crustal to the ocean convergence and the subduction zones. As you can see, this is the oceanic and this is the continental plate boundaries. Then they are zone of young fold mountains. There are Andes, there are Himalayas and others. There are Andes mountains. They are also the zone of active volcanoes as we know in the case of Japan. The second area is the mid Atlantic belt, which is the one on the screen. So this is your Atlantic Ocean and this is the mid Atlantic belt. This is the ocean to ocean and divergent plate boundaries where boundaries are moving in the opposite direction. Hence, there are shallow. They are because of the transform faults, fractures because of the splitting of the plates on the either direction. The third one is the mid continental belt, which contribute about 21% of the global earthquake. As you can see on the screen, this is the region of mid continental belt. And this is the region where the Turkey earthquake recently took place. They represent the weaker zones of folded mountain and the faults as we have talked about the Antelonia fault. So based on the discussion at place, let us now move to the next article for the day. This article of the Hindu newspaper appeared as a part of text and context and talks about a controversy with respect to the voice cloning or voice deep fakes that is now making news across the world. On January 29th, a several users on social media released different voices of important celebrities and in those voices they actually brought derogatory, racist and violent comments against various communities. Now seeing this trend, it brings a threat to the security, the national security across the world. So now from the perspective of UPSC examination in terms of science and technology, we are going to look into what are voice defects. As far as video defects or the image defects are concerned, we have already covered that in the previous DNS. Now the controversy says that speech synthesis or voice cloning was used with an application or a service provider with the term 11 labs. Now using this application, voice defects or many celebrities including Emma Watson was made in which racist, abusive and violent comments were created against certain communities without even taking the consent of these celebrities. The question is, what is voice defect? It actually closely mimic a real person's voice. Please understand this. It's a real person voice, not the computer's voice. So the computer's voice that we normally hear and if we are making a copy of it, if we are mimicking that voice, it is not going to be called deep fakes because it is not a real person voice. It is not a natural voice. So the voice deep fakes actually replicate the tone, accent, cadence and other unique characteristics that a person has. Maybe there is a person who has very deep voice. There might be a person who has a very shallow voice. So whatever it may be, this deep fake software is going to utilize that it will capture all their different changes, modulation in that voice and will try to make a copy of it. After that, whatever a person speaks, that speech is going to be transformed in the voice of the concerned target person. It is also called as the voice cloning or the synthetic voice. Now, how should we detect it? In order to detect whether a voice is a defake or not, we need highly advanced technologies, softwares and hardware that is not possible in the capacity of a single person. There are programs like Deep Trace, which help in providing certain protection to such kind of deep fake voices. But despite the best of the technology, it is not possible to trace back the origin of a particular deep voice. For that, we have to wait for the technology to further upgrade. Now the point is how deep fakes are created. These are created using the high end computers which can do 
large amount of calculation a person required graphic cards as well as the crowd computing power then the original recordings of a person are taken this voice data is then be processed using the different service providers like in this case there was 11 labs artificial intelligence is the one which is used for this data to render an authentic sounding voice and that is the reason why many people across the world are now saying that artificial intelligence can be more misused than what it can be used for the better purposes now what are the threats the first threat is that there can be defraud users they can steal the identity there can be phone scams for example there was a recent case in the united state abilets where a person acting as the voice of the branch manager called the deputy manager and got 35 million dollar transfer to a particular account this can also be used to post fake videos now as we have discussed in the deep fakes previously posting a fake video using the deep fake voice on the social media can create hurdles can create issues of law and order recently there was an example where deep fake voice was used in the film making with respect to a personality an actor who died some time ago now this also brings the ethical concern that should we try to use the talent of a person who has died so these are the important threats that are lying up ahead of the voice defix with this discussion please let us now move to the next article for the day this article of the hindu newspaper appeared on page 1 where it talks about appeal which was filed in the supreme court with respect to the elevation of a lawyer as a high court judge now the appeal has been rejected by the supreme court but today we are going to look into the aspect of lawyer becoming a judge to a particular high court or a supreme court a judge of a high court or a supreme court is appointed by warrant under the hand and seal of the indian president indian president is not at all at the disposal of his discretionary power to appoint any person as a high court judge he is going to take the decision on the suggestion given by the executive and this executive is going to work on the recommendation of collegium which consists four senior most judges and the cgi actually it is the president who is the head of the executive he is going to work on the advice rendered by the cgi and cgi is not going to provide the advice as a discretionary to his own office he is going to take the recommendation and the suggestion by a group of judges known as collegium after that president will act on the recommendation of the collegium once appointed a judge of a high court can work till the age of 62 now the question is why it is 62 when it is 65 for the supreme court the avenue is more in supreme court because there are times when a judge of a high court is promoted as a judge of supreme court if both of them have a age of 65 then there is no avenue available for the high court judge to be a supreme court judge as far as resignation and removal is concerned so the resignation of a high court judge should go to a person who actually appointed him and that is the president himself as far as removal is concerned so a high court judge is removed on the same line as the supreme court judge is removed which is mentioned under the article 124 which talks about the process of impeachment and here also president assent is required as far as vacation is concerned of the office a judge can vacate his office if he has become a judge to the supreme court or transferred to the other high court however this transfer should not be taken as a way of punishment it's not the case that if a person who is a judge in a Allahabad High Court is transferred to the, let's say, Jodhpur High Court in Rajasthan is taken as a matter of punishment. No. Article 124, Clause 4 talks about the removal through the process of impeachment on the ground of proved. See, the word is proved. Until unless it is proved, he cannot be removed. And the provision is with respect only to misbehavior and incapacity. However, the article does not talk about the process. The process is given by the parliament and here the parliament enjoys the power based on the article 124 clause 5. 
This article says that Parliament has the power to regulate the procedure and this procedure involves the investigation to find out whether a judge went through the misbehavior or incapacity or not. According to this article, Parliament enacted a law known as Judges Inquiry Act 1968 which lays down the entire process of the investigation and ultimately leading to the removal of judge. The qualification for the appointment as a High Court Judge under Article 217 Clause 2 are as follows. The first is that of course he should be a citizen of India and this citizenship is not limited to the birth. He or she should be a judicial officer in the territory of India for the period of 10 year. Now please understand this. If there is a judicial officer in the state of Uttar Pradesh, that person can be appointed as a high court judge in the Maharashtra itself. So this is a clear provision available in the constitution. The third is that if the above two conditions are not met, the third condition says that he or she should be a 10 year advocate of a high court or two or more high courts in the succession. Let's say three years in Allahabad and seven years in Delhi high court. The point is a jurist cannot be appointed as a high court judge, which is available for the case of Supreme Court judge. There are two important pointers that you should know. No judge ever appointed to the High Court will go for any other public employment after the retirement except becoming a judge of Supreme Court or CJI, becoming the governor or president and along with the president, of course, vice president. So these are the four offices that he or she can hold after the retirement as a public employment. The second says that retired judge of a high court can practice within other high courts or in the Supreme Court after retirement, but that person requires the permission. Now there's an important pointer over here. A high court judge who is retired cannot work in the same court, cannot practice in the same court. If a person has been a retired judge, let's say from the Delhi high court, that person cannot practice in the same court because of the conflict of interest. Otherwise, he or she can work anywhere. So based on this criteria, we clearly understand that a lawyer in India, if has practiced for 10 years in a high court or above can become a high court judge. With this discussion, please. Now we come to the end of today's Daily News Simplified. Thank you.